to explain thoroughly number two, which is what I'm going to do, I hope, in an article next year, um, which is nearing completion, and then show how two, two is one. So in other words, you show how division one is div two. Okay. Yeah, but uh, complementarity makes me very nervous. I mean, I love, I love Niels Bohr, he's my favorite physicist, but complementarity is not something that I've wanted to draw into uh, in my work at all, just because the, the theory in itself is, uh, makes me too nervous. I do, I've taken all kinds of other aspects of Bohr's work into publications of mine, uh, especially his sort of positivistic uh, interpretation of quantum phys physics, but not complementarity. But yeah, there are similarities, definitely. Okay, uh, Okay. so uh, I'm glad I have all these diagrams because it's better than reading all this. Um, okay, so I can sum up, those of you who are lost or would like a recap, this diagram here not only can sum everything up for us that I've just said, so far that is, but it also can lead to, can sort of be a jumping point to everything that really gets interesting about this. So division one, uh, sorry, this, uh, that what it says, what makes up what we see is, well, that's fine, that's fine, I can, that's no big deal. Um, I'll just leave it there. So division one is composed, this is the, the, the Buddhist atoms. Division two are, uh, we would usually say, uh, the empirical reality, you know, planets and animals and so forth, but in, from what I've just said, the Buddhist position is this is all the constructions of consciousness. Empirical reality is a construction of consciousness. So it's interesting to know, watch how, uh, no, so we're labeling here division one, what it's, what it's like, and division two, what it's like. Notice the uh, properties. Division one is composed of indivisible, uh, sorry, invisible items. Look at, look at here visible items can be perceived via sense organs. Division one is composed of immaterial items, and I'll explain why soon. Division two is the, is the domain of the material. This right here is, we call this material stuff, it's just the name we've given to it. Um, okay, so, the, okay, so division one, Buddhist atoms are partless, Everything in this domain has a part, is, is uh, composite, or is uh, a myriological item, is the technical word philosophers use for it. Uh, over here, items are surfaceless. Here, they have surfaces. Here, the, the Buddhist atoms are timeless, or nearly, very nearly timeless. Actually, uh, timeless is the word I'm going to stick with today. Over here, uh, items we believe exist in time. They persist. Over here, items are uncaused. One of the key, uh, dis just revolutionary discoveries of quantum physics, which was known to the Buddhists, uh, well, at least some of the Buddhists, way, way back. Um, like in my article called Our Theory of Time, that I published last year, I specifically, the whole point of that article is to show that the only correct interpretation of Buddhist atomism is to show that Buddhist atoms are utterly uncaused. Just very similar to the way uh, quantum and quantum particle dynamics, there is probabilistic causation, which I just translate as being randomness, or uh, a non-causality. Anyway, so over here, Buddhist atoms are motionless. This, these all go together. If something is timeless, it doesn't, you can't move through time, so it's motionless. Um, over here, items are caused to exist and have motion. Over here, Buddhist atoms don't touch each other. Uh, over here, these items touch. They don't touch. These items touch here because they have surfaces. Surface items don't have anything by which to touch each other by, since we need surfaces to touch. So nothing's. There's no touching over here, which gets to your connectedness point, which we'll get to. And typically, the Buddhist atoms are believed, you know, electrons and so forth are believed to compose this stuff. Um, Okay, so now here's the point. There's, there's some problems here. <laughs> um, you should notice. Uh, how exactly 
is an immaterial reality. If this is the case, if the, the level of the basic building blocks, quantum Buddhist atoms, compose everything, that's like saying that immaterial stuff composes material stuff. How does that work? That seems to be a problem. Oh, but it gets worse. Let's just uh, interpret the diagram here. Here's what I've got written for you to interpret. This is what we are asked to believe by any physicist, philosopher, anybody who wants to tell us that the reality that we see is largely as we see it and it is composed of a quantum reality. Then this is what follows. Then we say back to him or her, then you live in a causal world that is composed of non-causal items. That doesn't sound uh, too kosher. You live in a world of surfaces and colors. You know, look around you, surf all you see are surfaces and colors. Every single experience about your outer world can be reduced to surfaces and colors, even things like heat and sound and so forth. That's another issue though, um, which I've discussed elsewhere. Uh, so the world of surfaces and colors that you find yourself in is composed of a world that is colorless and surfaceless. That's a huge problem. That actually, does anybody know how long that's been known? This is not me just uh, discussing. Pardon? How long? This is Zeno, one of Zeno's paradoxes. The uh, measure paradox. What was Zeno? 450, 550. He's way back in the, in the BCs in Greece. Um, Here's, an equ here's what the mathematical equation would look like. If surfaceless things compose surfaces, this is what the mathematical equation would look like. Zero, so S equals surface, so no surface. All of you have had third grade math, so this should be a pretty easy equation. A surf zero surface plus zero surface plus zero surface plus zero surface equals a greater than zero surface. That seems to be a mathematical disaster. How can a bunch of zeros, a bunch of uh, zeros all of a sudden give, lead us to non-zero? Uh, there's only one philosopher I know of who's ever had a serious attempt to uh, try to show us how this can be. His name is Adolf Grunbaum, who still works at the University of Pittsburgh. And in some famous papers in 1952, 1956, and so forth, he allegedly solved this and showed that miraculously. This isn't a problem. Uh, however, in four publications of mine from 2003 to 2005, and one coming out later this year, I've shown that his solution apparently does not work. Uh, which should serve, which should not be a surprise, because we all know that um, this would appear to be a simple equation. Okay. If you study binary uh, uh, mathematics, maybe there's some loopholes. But then again, it seems our trust in this equation being an absurdity. This, equ this equal sign right here needs to go away. There is, there is no equal sign. Uh, so that's what uh, the diagram results in. And that's what, so there's a problem. Let me just keep going with this and then we'll keep moving here. So also other things that the diagram shows are you live in a material world that is composed of immaterial items as I've seen. You live in a visible world composed of invisible items. You live in a world of persisting items that are composed of momentary and truly fleeting non-persisting items. And so this last point is kind of like this. Um, if you look at a lion, this is an example from um, an article I have coming out. If you look at a lion from a distance so you can't see it's, you know, the little fine pieces of its fur and so forth. So it's gonna, it's ba the back of the lion is going to look like a gold smooth um, piece of lion. Uh, so, just, so just imagine that lion, you know, sitting in, in uh, the zoo or Africa or whatever. And you're not going to see the, the, uh, the lion flipping in and out of existence. It's going to appear to you that that smooth patch of golden fur just continues to exist through time. So you see it now, and then at another moment, another moment, and so forth. So what's the problem? They just persist through time. The problem is,